Welcome back to The World This Week with me, Jonathan Steele. Sweden has often been noted for its high standard of living and moderation. But this reputation has come into doubt after riots gripped the country last week. The disruption took place in a Stockholm suburb called Huspe, where 80% of residents were either first or second generation immigrants. Some are speculating the riots have something to do with the steep rise in inequality as well as soaring support for the Sweden Democrats, a far-right party, in recent years. Here's Amanda Thomas-Johnson with more. Often known for its progressiveness, equality and high standard of living, Sweden over the last week has been convulsed by riots. These scenes in the Stockholm suburb of Husby, a largely immigrant community, were triggered after police fatally shot a 67-year-old Portuguese man allegedly wielded in a machete. Schools, banks, a police station and at least 150 cars were all attacked and set ablaze during the seven nights of unrest. So why did this all happen? Some have pointed towards Sweden's soaring unemployment and growing inequality, something that has particularly hit immigrant communities. Sweden's renowned social welfare scheme has been rolled back over the last 20 years. It now has the fastest growing inequality gap of any highly developed country. There has also been a rightward shift in Swedish politics, since 2006, the country has been governed by an alliance of centre-right parties. This has led to a raft of measures affecting ethnic minority groups, such as Operation River, which in a bid to locate, imprison and deport undocumented migrants, has led to ethnic minorities being discriminated against based on appearance. Furthermore, there was also the continuing rise of far-right groups in the country, marginalising immigrant communities. The Sweden Democrats, a far-right group whose policies include the banning of Islam and a curb on immigration, achieved parliamentary representation in 2010. But with rising inequality, xenophobia and racism setting in, can Sweden still be considered the face of European progressiveness? With similar riots in London a few years ago and the rise of far-right groups throughout Europe, are racial tensions now at boiling point throughout Europe? Well, joining me in the studio to discuss all this is Nicholas Smalley, researcher at the Department for Scandinavian Studies, University College London, and on, f on the phone from Stockholm, Fazila Selberg Zaib, a writer and lecturer based there, and by Skype, also from Stockholm, Mehmet Kaplan, who is a member of the Swedish Parliament for the Green Party. Well, Nicola, let me come to you first of all. What are the underlying causes of these riots? That's a very complex question and one that I don't think anybody has an answer to, really. Although lots of people have, you know, their own particular kind of agendas and, and thoughts behind the riots. Um, but I would argue that the rise of inequality and um, kind of institutional and direct racism in Swedish society has had a major effect on the way that young people feel, um, the way that young kind of people in marginalised um, marginalised kind of areas feel, um, and I think that there's a major feeling of um, kind of invisibility for a lot of people, and that they don't feel that anybody's anybody wants to listen to them. They don't feel like they even have the opportunity to raise their voices in society, um, and that this is kind of a you know them flaring up in some way, or, I mean, it's not them, you know, it's a, a group of people within this, um, within, within these kind of um, peripheral um, suburban areas in Sweden who are, who are... Um, but do you think it's very similar to the London riots? Didn't they both get kicked off by the shooting by the police of somebody? Uh, yep, I mean, um, in 2011, the London riots were um, many of... Um, many would argue, uh, kind of uh, catalyzed by the shooting of Mark Duggan uh, by the police and by the subsequent, um, subsequent handling by the police of that, of that incident. And, and I think that um, the, the Swedish situation is similar, that um, a, lot of, uh, a lot of people feel that the police didn't deal with it as well as they should have done and uh, the police weren't kind of... Um, Honest with the citizens of, of Stockholm, um, in, in you know, as regards that that killing. L let me bring in uh, Fazila from Stockholm. D do you see the causes as being primarily economic, to do with unemployment and inequality, or do you see them as some kind of reaction to 
racism and xenophobia in Sweden? I think it's not mutually exclusive, and I think there are very, very many reasons, both known and unknown, and we're still sort of uh, gathering facts and, and, and also, more importantly, talking to, to the people in the area themselves and letting them actually uh, give their side of the story, which is something that uh, I think has been an issue in, in the past where, you know, journalists very rarely visit these areas, uh, usually only when something burns. And, I mean, that gives a very, very strange uh, sort of a uh, view on the, of the suburbs in Sweden. But I think uh, there are many factors, and I think there, there are factors that, that made the riots sort of um, explode the way that they have done. And, and I think w- one of the reasons has been uh, police, uh, sort of the police that were in Husby specifically participating in, in sort of keeping the calm, as they uh, uh, expressed it. They were very brutal in the first and second night. Uh, and and uh, they were not part of the local police team that is known here, known by the people here, uh, who would no doubt have handled things very, very differently. And the outcome would, I believe, have been perhaps uh, much more sort of, well, less burned cars, if we put it that way. So I think there there are many different explanations for, for why the riots started and why they got out of hand the way they have done. Um, and I think there are a lot of agendas here that we're not aware of uh, why people are participating. And, and some that are participating are clearly criminals uh, who are out to, to, to really destroy people's properties. And, and those that are affected are, are the people living in these areas, mm-hmm. regular people, the ones that are being accused of it. So it's a very messy situation indeed. Let me, let me turn to you, Mehmet Kaplan. Um, you are a member of the Swedish parliament, as we said in the introduction for the Green Party. Why do you think the far right, particularly the Sweden Democrats, have been doing so well in recent years? Is it uh, based on on anti-immigration and and some kind of uh, racist uh, policy? Uh, Actually, uh, this uh, anti-immigrant and Islamophobic uh, uh, party have been there for a long time, but they haven't made it to the Swedish parliament until recently, 2010 elections. And uh, many uh, social, uh, political scientists uh, was believing that Sweden was a little bit different from other uh, countries in Europe, because we have seen the situation similar to the Swedish situation with uh, quite a large number of, of migrants who are coming to Sweden and most of the Swedish people uh, who are living in this country uh, is thinking that it is a good idea. But this uh, populist and quite Islamophobic party made it to the parliament and uh, it was the first time such a party did it. In the early 90s we had a populistic party, the New Democrats, uh, who actually was in the Swedish parliament, but they were not as Islamophobic and not as racist as the, this party. Then uh, one can, of course, uh, discuss uh, the issues, and this is what we have done the last three years. Uh, but the main, one main reason which many political scientists is believing in is that the, this uh, uh, rising in equality, and this is not only the, the, the government parties today, but also the social democrat government in the, the 90s who has started to, to cut down on, on public uh, uh, funding. And uh, this is one of the reasons the, uh, the political scientists said. But the other reason is, of course, that uh, the, uh, this kind of idea sometimes is spreading all over Europe. And uh, I think it is very hard for a, a small country, which is uh, a part of Europe today, uh, since 94 actually, uh, can uh, keep them out. So I think they are here to stay, but uh, the important is what the, the normal parties, if you can say so, are doing in the parliament. And uh, I believe that uh, until this racist party uh, came in, uh, the other parties, some of the other parties have... Uh, the similar ideas and similar practice and uh, policies in the Swedish parliament. So they, they are not the only one, if you can say so. We are eight parties in the Swedish parliament today. But uh, you're from Turkey originally, I, I believe. Do, do any of the, does the Social Democratic Party or the main uh, governing party, do they have any um, people of uh, Muslim background or immigrant background in their, uh, in their ranks in, as members of parliament? 
So yes, uh, the the government, the big government party, the moderate party, which is the light uh, conservative, uh, have a Muslim MP, and they also have people with migrant background within uh, their cadres, and uh, they are 99 MPs in total. And Social Democrat is 107, and they also have uh, uh, MPs with the Muslim background. So that kind of representation have been uh, there uh, quite a while. But we just recently had a, a, a big happening when the, the party board of the Social Democrat Party actually kicked out a, a person, a member of the party board with Muslim background, just because of they uh, blamed him as an anti-Semite, which was not the case. So there have been some uh, very uh, important cases just recently about the issue with the, with the Muslim background in, in Swedish politics. Let me come back to you, uh, Nicola. I mean, this suburb of Husby, where it started, mm -hmm. is that what you might call a ghetto? Is it sort of very heavily dominated by one group of people, or is it is it a mixed area? It is a very mixed area, um, and I think ghetto is a really strong word, and people kind of sling it around. Um, but it's, it's very mixed area in that there are lots and lots of people from lots of different areas living there, or, you know, lot, actually lots of people who are born in Sweden, um, but also people who've migrated from many different countries. Um, but there aren't that many Swedish people living there. So it's not that there's one group overrepresented. There's lots and lots of groups, but the proportion of, of kind of, you know, ethnic Swedes, if you will, is, is relatively low in comparison with the center, like the center of the city, or indeed some other suburbs. And then um, the people who were actually rioting, were they almost 100% from an ethnic uh, minority background or Muslim background? I don't think that Islam is particularly a concern here. I don't think that um, that religion has that much to do with these riots. I might be wrong, um, and you know I'm observing everything from from quite an outsider's standpoint. I'm British and I live in the, in London. You know I haven't been to Stockholm for a few months, so I haven't you know I wasn't able to see with my own eyes what was going on. Um, but I think that from from the photos that I've seen and the general. Um, the general impression that I've got from reading news reports and speaking to friends who are living in Stockholm, the um, the large, you know, the majority of uh, of people involved in the riots were um, were of immigrant background of some kind. Um, but as I say, you know, I, I I'm happy to be corrected on that point. Well, let me let me ask Fazila that point then, since you are in Stockholm. At Mm. Well, would one say that 95% um, or 100% of the people who are rioting were of immigrant origin or the children of immigrants? I don't think we could say that either because some of them were masked and, and, uh, and some were not. And uh, a lot of, uh, I would say that, yes, a lot of them were of uh, immigrant background, but uh, it is not known exactly from which background very mixed. Uh, and, and obviously Sweden has a lot of immigrants who are not Muslims, and we, we need to remember that. Uh, a lot of Eritreans live there, and they're both Muslim and Christian, uh, and so on and so forth, live in, specifically in Husby. Uh, so, you know, the, to make it into a Muslim issue is very, very typical of our day. I mean, soon we'll be blaming global warming on Muslims as well. Mm -hmm. And I would like to bring another perspective here, which is, I mean, not so long ago, maybe two, two days ago, there was a major... Um, clash between football supporters and, and the police uh, during a football game, and, and it was a very violent one. Uh, and nobody has has been writing about this in the media in the lines of, okay, where are their parents, and you know what kind of culture do these people come from, uh, and what kind of religion is, is part of you know uh, bringing about this violence, this really unprovoked violence. Uh, in, in, during a football game, and, and I, I think Britain can relate to that with, with a lot of f football writing or, or hooliganism going on there as well. Um, it, it's a matter of who decides the agenda of the debates and how we decide to sort of interpret events happening in society. So there is an exotification of the suburb also taking place, where it's like it's a foreign land where other rules apply and 
I mean, yes, uh, we need to talk about the, the issues that are going on there, and, and there's a massive inequality situation going on uh, affecting all the suburbs where there is a very big mix of immigrants living there with Muslim and non-Muslim background, Christians and mm-hmm. and so on and so forth. Uh, so I think I think that's also a very important perspective to, to realize when, when, when we start thinking about religion and all of this. It has nothing to do with Islam at all. Mehmet, let me turn to you again now. Um, I mean, we've been talking, using the word immigrant. Uh, um, We haven't talked about asylum seeker or refugee, and we know that Sweden has a fantastically good reputation, probably the best in the world for taking refugees. It took hundreds during the Bosnian crisis 10 years ago, and then it took hundreds of people from Iraq, even though Sweden had nothing to do with the invasion of Iraq and, and in a way, quotes, didn't need, unquotes, to take uh, Iraqi refugees. Uh, So are these the people who are rioting children of asylum seekers or asylum seekers themselves, or or are they, in fact, is immigrant the right word in the sense that they came uh, for economic reasons? Uh, I have to agree with uh, what Fazila said, actually, because it's very hard to point out uh, uh, who the majority was of. I, I'm actually living in the area. I'm uh, today living just one mile away from Husby, and I have been living in Husby for 17 years. So this is my suburbs, and my mother and father is living there. My 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 little sister and little brother is still living there. So uh, I'm going to the mosque there uh, as as much as I can, and I have some uh, community works uh, doing there. So. I know many of the people, and when we went out uh, the second day, uh, we met a lot of people uh, who was actually not from from Husby, and some of them didn't look like they were of migrant background, but there were not many. But as Fazila said, they were masked, uh, those who was actually throwing stones and making the riots. But after a while, we, we, there were loads of uh, adult people, massive adult uh, presence in the, on the streets, and that actually stopped it. So it spread to other cities and other suburbs. But uh, I think, the, the, as you said, uh, Sweden has, uh, the last year, Sweden has, ta- uh, has received uh, around 100,000 uh, people from all around the world, and uh, some of them have been uh, work migrants, uh, some labor force, some of them have been asylum seekers, and some of them have been people who is returning back uh, after being uh, out of Sweden. So uh, there are different kind of people, and in Husby, this, it's a mosaic. It's like people from all around the world, and uh, it's very hard to point out a group. And I totally agree also with, uh, with Fazil and the uh, uh, the, the the other speaker uh, that uh, uh, Nicola that uh, the, the Muslim issue or the Islam issue hasn't been present at all. Not even the Sweden Democrats actually from the party leader side has said anything about this right that it could have something to do with with uh, Muslims or Islam. Uh, they have been focusing on uh, the the very racist party Sweden Democrats have been focusing on that this is only about migration, that Sweden has taken, received too much migrants, and this is what happens when you receive too much migrants. This is their and core has, has the result been over the last few years since the Sweden Democrats came into parliament that Sweden is less generous now about accepting refugees and asylum seekers? No, no uh, it's the opposite, actually. 2010, when the Sweden Democrats uh, came into the parliament, uh, the Green Party, my party, which I'm the leader, uh, group leader of, uh, uh, made a decision to uh, cooperate with the sitting government to uh, make the migrant laws more liberal. So mm. since 2008, we already had a, a labor force uh, uh, migration uh, connection with the government, which means that anybody who uh, is applying for a job and gets a job in Sweden uh, wherever you are coming from in the world, you can actually move here. And then after four years, you will get a permanent resident visa. Uh, and uh, just recently, two months ago, we also had a new agreement with the government, the Green Party and the four governmental parties, that uh, migrants who are sick, or uh, asylum seekers who are sick or ill or have children which have been living here for years, uh, should get a, a visa uh, much easily. 
and also should be part of the healthcare, and also should uh, the children should be able to go to the school without police actually coming and taking them. So what have happened is that it's the opposite of many other European countries. When a racist party comes into the the parliament, normally the government is uh, somehow uh, uh, adjusting their policies towards migrants and making it uh, more harder uh, for them. Uh, in Sweden, and, and it has when you, been when the you talk about, I mean, the Sweden Democrats are a, a parliamentary party and they, they, they got members of parliament. Is there any group in Sweden which is similar to the English Defence League here in Britain, which is, you know, on the street and, and really provoking clashes and, and, and holding demonstrations against uh, immigrants or refugees or asylum seekers? Or is the Sweden Democrats about as right wing as you can get uh, now in, on this issue in Sweden? There are smaller parties in municipalities. Uh, for instance, in southern Swede, uh, Stockholm suburb, Södertälje, there are a party called National Democrats, which are even more right from Sweden Democrats. Uh, and we also have uh, the Swedish uh, party, which the Svenskarnas party, which is a far right, uh, actually a national socialist party almost. So we have some minor groups, but they are very far away from coming into the parliament. We have, we have a system with a proportional uh, election system, which means that if you get 4% of the votes in the country, you will get in the parliament. So Sweden Democrats is the first one, uh, but their, their roots are actually, uh, according to uh, political scientists, their roots is going back to uh, keep Sweden Swedish, uh, which is a, was a, actually a movement which was very much like uh, EDL. And we also just recently have a, a Swedish Defence League formed, uh, w uh, which was in inspired by EDL, as I understood. And on this riot, j just two, three days ago, we got reports that there were some of these uh, thugs uh, who... Start, try to do some uh, media fuzz, but they didn't manage because the police is really uh, are, know them very well and uh, they, they are really keeping them on ground. Fazila, let me turn to you again. In your opening answer, you talked about the police very strongly and, and how they didn't behave well, and that's a point that Nicola also made and I think Mehmet has made as well. Uh, the, the, has the media, and obviously as a journalist I'm very conscious of how the media, what a role it can play in fanning prejudice or, or calming things down, have they taken up the issue of police mishandling or police brutality or have they largely kind of uh, been neutral on that issue or even supporting the police? Well, I think initially media uh, went with the police uh, commentary on the situation, uh, you know, initially, and that was interpreted as, you know, media taking the the stance of of the police. Um, so, I, I, and they have obviously, as time has passed, uh, included other voices, and they have been out in the suburbs, and and uh, they've been uh, airing live from from Husby and other places. But a lot of the criticism has been that. Um, that they have been having headlines, and this is something that we, we hear a lot from a lot of the, the youth there, that, you know, they're reporting live from Husby and, and talking about the chaos, and it, it was absolutely calm. There was nothing going on. It was absolutely calm. It was, I don't know, 10 o'clock or 11 o'clock at night. Uh, and so media has been criticized from that point of view uh, of sort of, you know, wanting to create a, a hype that isn't there. I mean, the first two nights were terrible. There were there was a lot of fires, uh, you know, uh, put on uh, a lot of cars set on fire, uh, fire and other uh, buildings and so on. But after that, it's been very, very calm. It has been thanks to the residents there who have mobilized uh, to keep the calm uh, and so on. So, uh, in that sense, media has been criticized uh, a lot. And and also, I would say, even now. Um, uh, media witnessed, uh, Express and uh, one big magazine or newspaper in Sweden, witnessed the attack on a, on a, what is said to be a Muslim woman of Somali background in Rinkibi, a neighboring suburb, uh, by mm -hmm. uh, what was also said by eyewitnesses as being a Nazi group of youth part of this uh, citizen guard that is, uh, I, I would definitely call them a neo-Nazi, and they are being called in the media as a neo-Nazi neo 
group where they've sort of taken it on themselves to protect Swedish streets from, from these like, these terrible immigrants. Uh, and they attacked her with a hammer. She's in hospital. But media did not write that it was a neo-Nazi group of gang, a, a group of youth. And they did not write that it was a, a woman of sort of Somali background. They just wrote... A, All right. A, I'm a sorry. We, we're running out of time. So I, I'm going to have to cut you up. I, I cut you off. I'm very sorry about that. But uh, Fazila, thank you very much. And Mehmet Kaplan by Skype, very much. Thank you too. And to Nicholas Smalley here in the studio in London.